Welcome to all. Hi, I'm Susan Stacy, and I am with the Association of Lifelong Learners, and in conjunction and collaboration with the League of Women Voters, we are putting on this informational presentation tonight, uh, hopefully to get people to understand the importance of the census and why you need to participate and what the process is going to be, which is a little bit different than it has been in the past. Uh, tonight we've got Tim Kuhnlein, I think everybody here is pretty familiar with Tim. Um, he's going to give us uh, a history on the census and where it came from and how it happened and, and the importance of it. And then Patrick, everybody, if he ever gets his, his slides. <laughs> I'm ready, I'm ready. I'm mostly ready. So Patrick's going to talk, give us an update on where we are in Northeast Michigan and what's going on with it there. David Springsteen is a guest tonight, and David is a partner specialist with the Department of Commerce, and David is going to give us an update on what's going on in the state. Um, I'm Susan Stacy. I'm going to talk to you about our project that we are doing with all. And uh, then Doris is going to give you a bit of an update, Doris Face, and she's going to give you an update on what the League of Women Voters is doing. We are glad you came out on this snowy, cold evening, and so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Tim, you want to start us off? Okay, well, thank you. Um, just a little bit of uh, history and political uh, history significance. Um, obviously, the census is nothing new. Um, they were taking the census uh, uh, stats back in Roman times, right? We all know that. Um, and also, in our context, colonial history was very much ripe with a census taking under the British Empire. The first U.S. census was taken in 1790, uh, shortly after the establishment of the country. It took 18 months to actually tabulate um, to gather the data and tabulate it for 4 million people, that was the population then. Um, this is our 23rd iteration of the census, um, and we're trying to uh, uh, determine uh, exactly how many people, roughly 330 million people are estimated to live in the U.S. today. And that's exactly what the census is trying to do, determine who and where, because of the value that that information gives us. All indications are the 2000 um, uh, 10 census uh, until now will be a roughly 8% increase in the population. So um, the word census is actually not mentioned in the Constitution at all. Um, the word is enumeration. And I'd like to, just as a, um, these days I think it's important we consult this document because we don't seem to be following it. Um, representatives and direct taxes this is Article 1, Section 2, shall be a portion among the several states which may be included within this union, according to the respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, those are critical words, including um, those bound to service for a term of years and excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons. That's critical language as well. And then it continues in that same paragraph. The actual enumeration shall be made within three years after the first meeting of the Congress of the United States and within every subsequent term of 10 years in such manner as they shall by law direct. And then in Amendment 14, there's additional language. A representative shall be apportioned among the several states, according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state, excluding Indians not taxed. So those are some very critical terms, especially in light of the controversies, um, most recently and certainly throughout history. Um, in terms of the breakdown of debates historically, I would, I would break them into two categories. Political controversies, this is clearly a political issue, um, fighting over representation, um, and the distribution of resources, which I think we'll hear a lot about tonight. It really started, the first struggle was, do we count black people as 
whole persons. Clearly they were not going to be able to vote and they were not considered citizens, but they were to be used, once again, for purposes of representation in places like South Carolina where 60% of the population was enslaved. And Southern white men, property owners, wanted their property counted. And the settlement and the great compromise was that they would be counted as three-fifths of a person. That would bolster Southern influence in the proportional representation of the House of Representatives in a significant way. Um, the first slaves were actually scheduled in 1850, so they were actually counted for the first time in 1850 in the census. And the second time in 1860, which would of course be the last time. Uh, the debates then continue about race, uh, particularly for blacks, and the question of blood and issues of purity. From 1850 through 1930, there's a meticulous debate about how much blood was white blood and how much was black blood. Of course, the ancestry is a critical issue in the current um, uh, census. How do we measure it and what does it mean? Of course, the largest ethnic minority in this country, according to census data, is German, German heritage. Uh, whether it's accurate or not, reliable is another story, it's self-reporting. The debates on um, immigration, of course, central to the current uh, debates along with citizenship, but this is, has deep historical roots. The question of Indian populations, gays, uh, transgender populations, prisoners, they are counted where they reside in the prison, which then makes the um, apportionment uh, skewed, one might say, and it's a highly controversial subject. And of course, most recently, the issue of citizenship and non-citizenship and the benefits, the pros and cons for even um, measuring that. Um, of course, where immigrants are existing, it will bolster the numbers of those communities and hurt um, areas, perhaps rural areas, and some states that um, are not necessarily recipients of the immigrant populations. And then lastly, the debate on estimates versus accuracy, on estimates versus actual counts in terms of accuracy, um, whether it's the actual census or the, the measurements taken between the, um, the 10 year periods. So trust and confidence are a big issue. The other factor is fear. Political controversy is one thing, but the fear of government intrusion, um, privacy issues, surveillance, um, the anti-government rhetoric that uh, realized itself in the last census with someone being hung um, and uh, having census written across the chest. This was in Kentucky in 2009. And of course, the, the fears are real. Uh, the Japanese and German internments um, in 1942 where census data was used to find both non-citizens and citizens and remove them from their homes and place them in internment camps. Uh, the FBI was complicit in gathering this data. Um, there is a 72-year moratorium on the disaggregated information accumulated from the census. Um, personal identification is not to be revealed for a 72-year period. So that would mean that the current census data would not be revealed um, other than the aggregate statistics until 2092. Of course, 1948 would be the information being revealed currently. So clearly, the issue of representation in the House, as well as the Electoral College, these are the political stakes, um, as well as state um, redistricting, gerrymandering, all based on the apportionment of how these numbers reflect um, how much each state gets in terms of representation. And then, of course, the redistribution of resources um, amounting to a roughly $1 trillion in federal resources based on the demographic data. From um, age to rural status, uh, socioeconomic, rich, poor, minorities, renters, and so forth. These details help shape policy and um, ultimately determine financial investments that even the private sector uses to determine whether, for example, it's worthwhile building a mire in Northeast Michigan or something of this sort. But this particular census is most pivotal 
as they all are, but this one in particular because it's the first electronic um, estimate, or I should say um, gathering, uh, which poses all sorts of security issues. Um, the expectation is that we register online uh, by phone, and lastly by paper. And given what happened in Iowa recently, there's great concern. Um, what we gather, the information we gather in this round, will determine two presidential elections in terms of the Electoral College, at least the distribution of influence by state, and six congressional elections, um, leading us through the year 2030. Michigan is pretty much destined to lose one congressional seat and one seat in the Electoral College, based on estimates. What makes this a particularly difficult uh, and pivotal census is the mobility of the population. Um, it's difficult to count, and we see also a major shift, primarily from the Midwest to the South. Uh, Florida and Texas are the two states expected to gain two to three seats. Um, and of course, lack of resources. The federal government has cut uh, the resources. It's very expensive, about $16 billion to conduct this study. And um, the number of people that uh, we've secured to actually make the count is falling somewhere, I, I'm not mistaken, somewhere 50% less than needed. Um, and they're talking about 500,000 people to actually conduct, uh, to follow through on the logistics. <coughs> um, it's not the first time that we've seen some major moves. 1890 was the first time the census was mechanized with tabulating machines. In 1970, we see the first mail census being used, a snail mail, that is. And then 2000, the first time GPS was used for tagging. Um, so that's just some little background of both history and politics. Um, I just wanted to share with you the statistics on education quickly to show you how this information is useful. Um, and other than collecting it this way, we don't gather this information. 15% um, of people living in Alpena County have a bachelor's degree or higher. 15%. That's very low. The, the Michigan uh, percentage is 25%. It was 13% for Michigan and 13% uh, 13 in 2000. But the 2000 stats show 15% for higher education. That, that shapes whether companies will come here, whether it's um, Boeing um, and various other scenarios that we've all seen recently. Um, it'll probably play out in whether we get those rockets down <laughs> in us go down as well. In the United States, it's a 28% bachelor's or higher statistic. In our surrounding counties, Montmorency, Alcona, and Priscilla are 10%, 12%, and 15% respectively, <coughs> well below half the national um, percentages. So with that, I think I stayed within my 10 minutes. So I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank you. Two thanks. That was very informational. I just learned a whole bunch of things that I didn't know. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick now, and he's going to talk about, um, and he has a slideshow, and he's going to talk about what's going on. Thank you. Um, good evening. First, I want to start by thanking the Association of Lifelong Learners for putting this on this evening, uh, also with the League of Women Voters. Uh, this year marks the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, so um, that's, that's great. Um, so, uh, Executive Director of the Community Foundation for Northeast Michigan, I have learned more about the census in the last eight months than I thought that I would ever learn in my entire lifetime. And as Tim shared, uh, it, is a, it is a big deal. Um, the census is the largest peacetime government project in the country. Think about that. They're going to reach out to 330 million households this year in the next few months. Uh, it's, it's, it's a little mind-boggling. So. Uh, Community Foundation for Northeast Michigan, I think that it's helpful for maybe for you to see what our region is, just to kind of have an idea as to what our scope is for this. So we pretty much cover all nine counties in Northeast Michigan. Um, Alpena, Mount Marenzi, Presque Isle, and Alcona, this is Community Foundation for Northeast Michigan. We have our affiliates, the Straits Area Community Foundation, which is Sheboygan County and Mackinac City. 
Crawford, Oscoda, and Ogama is our North Central Michigan Community Foundation, and then the Iosco Community Foundation. So when you think about Northeast Michigan, we serve all nine counties. So why a nonprofit, right? Why would the Community Foundation for Northeast Michigan get involved in the census? There are a lot of people that are working on making sure that there is an accurate count. When you take a look at the historically undercounted population, most of those individuals are being touched somewhere along the way by a nonprofit. And that nonprofit is a trusted source of information. So the Michigan Nonprofit Association, uh, with support from the Council of Michigan Foundations, actually has you know, started this work about two years ago. Um, we're staying in the nonprofit lane because those are the relationships that we have, and that's where our funding came from. So the Michigan Nonprofit Association provided the Community Foundation with $50,000 to help with administrative costs, as well as $50,000 that we could re-grant out to those organizations that uh, uh, would have contact or would work with that at-risk population. So nonprofits, uh, it's really the trusting relationships um, uh, that, are, that are there. <coughs> Who's most at risk of being undercounted in this census? Young children, elderly people, low-income people, people in rural communities, people without internet access. Does that sound familiar? I mean, that's really Northeast Michigan. Tim mentioned earlier that this is the first time that they'll look to uh, do the census by first electronically, that's their preferred method for everyone to respond to the census is online. And while most of the country, 80% of households and 70% of people have, have internet access, we're kind of almost the exact opposite here in Northeast Michigan. So we've got some challenges. But these are the people that are at risk uh, of being undercounted. So what's at stake? Well, you know, Tim talked about it. He introduced the, the redistricting. All right, so uh, the first population counts will be used to fulfill the constitutional purpose of reallocating constitutional uh, congressional seats. Federal funding, um, federal funding that's used for housing, Head Start programs, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, food assistance, highway construction and planning, um, hospitals, broadband and internet. The most recent numbers that are out there, uh, George Washington Institute of Public Policy, in 2016, the federal government distributed $883 billion. That's a lot of money. In the state of Michigan, the numbers are from 2015, and Michigan received more than $14 billion. So it's critical that every person is counted so we can receive our, our, our share of those federal dollars. Probably the number that I've seen uh, out there most often is $1,800 per person per year. I mean, that's kind of the number that, that's out there. So for us, if we do, if we are undercounted by 16%, that means $48 million annually for Northeast Michigan. I know you can do the math, $480 million over the next 10 years. Without inflation. Without inflation. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> yeah. Without inflation. So there is uh, a lot at stake. All right. Fifty thousand dollars certainly is a tremendous sum of money, but when you're spreading that and trying to spread that out amongst nine counties, uh, it, it, it doesn't go as far as, as we would like it to go. These are some of the grants that was that were made uh, through the Community Foundation. Um, you know, Demska, I'm not going to go through all of it, but Demska certainly deals with, uh, certainly, the very young. Uh, they do a lot, but the populations that they have are the very young, as well as the elderly, uh, and they cover all nine counties that we serve, so they receive um, the largest single grant. Um, but we uh, spread that $50,000 uh, around the nine counties uh, um, as best we could. All right. So I just want to spend a moment on some of the rumors that are out there. Already there is fraud that is trying to be perpetrated. Um, seniors, calls to seniors, 
We'll complete the census for you for $25. Uh, we'll take care of it. You don't need to worry about it. It's not true. You will never be asked for your social security number. You will never be asked for your bank account information, your health information, or your citizenship status. Right? What will you be asked? Really, they're looking for age, date of birth, are you Hispanic origin, um, what's your telephone number, uh, nine questions. So, 10 minutes to answer nine questions, and that will impact 10 plus years of funding. This is kind of a little bit of the sample questionnaire uh, that we were able to pull. Um, these questionnaires will go out, uh, they, they begin the outreach to get you to begin answering the census mid-March is when the first uh, um, contact will be made. They'll follow that up again in a couple of weeks, follow it another couple of weeks. The self-reporting ends in July. So I would encourage everyone to self-report as early as possible uh, in the process. So who needs to be counted? Everybody in the house. Parents and grandparents, newborn babies, born that day, uh, infants, toddlers, school-aged children, and kids over 18 still living at home. This is a little bit about the timeline. March 2020 is when it will begin. April and July, reminder letter and postcards. July 20, July is the self-response deadline. This is when census workers will begin knocking on your door uh, if you don't self-respond by July. By December, the Census Bureau delivers counts to the president, and then in March, states receive their official count. So how can you help? Well, so when everyone is counted, everybody wins. So I would encourage you to please, first of all, make sure you're counted, and then make sure your neighbors are counted, or your, your, your people that go to your church, uh, people that you uh, uh, have, have social groups with, um, make sure that you're counted uh, and that everyone else is counted. I pulled some numbers right before I came here um, as far as jobs that are still available. Um, I mean, this is a huge lift. Uh, and they're going to need a tremendous amount of workers. So this is the 2020 census recruiting goals as of Monday. And El Pino looks pretty good. 67.6% .6 of those jobs. So 68% of those jobs at $18 an hour are filled. Presquillo. Pretty good, 62%. Then we get into Mount Morency County and Alcona County. Alcona County, as of Monday, 46% of the jobs were filled at $14 an hour. Mount Morency County, 35% of the jobs are filled. So there's jobs that are out there and jobs that are important uh, for the accurate count. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dave Springsteen. Uh, can I introduce him? Sure, absolutely. So I had a chance to meet Dave. Um, uh, Dave lives in Traverse City. Um, he is a partner specialist. Uh, he was assigned to our region. I got to meet our new partner specialist just a little bit earlier uh, tonight. Uh, who's out of Gaylord, so a little closer. Um, but Dave has been instrumental um, in our learning curve and in supporting uh, the community foundation uh, as we do the census uh, out there. So Dave's for Thank you, Patrick. Standing's not my strong suit. Uh, I, no, coming in after these two, they have really given you a lot of great detail. I'm really, um, normally would talk through everything that they've talked through, but I just want to fill in just a few gaps or give a little bit more detail um, on some of the process so you have an understanding. It seems like it's, it's been fluid for the last few months, but really we got a solid idea of how Northern Michigan is going to be handled. We talk about Northeast Michigan, and I know that's, that's your area. My area, until really recently, um, I covered everything knuckles up Lower Peninsula and the Upper I mean, up, knuckles up Lower Peninsula and the Upper Peninsula. And I'll say that in that entire territory, we, um, we everybody shares the same hard to count uh, demographics, really, really do. And when we, one thing we didn't talk on is snowbirds. Uh, I want to bring up because a lot of you probably have friends right now that are in Arizona or Florida or Nevada or somewhere a lot warmer than it is outside right now. But when you when you're talking with them, you're communicating with them here as the census rolls in, 
um, it's really important to make sure that um, you encourage them, you know, to get counted. They're, they may be confused because they're going to receive, uh, you know, something from us at their residence here in Michigan. They're going to receive something for their residence in whatever other state they're in. So they have to make a decision to determine where they want to be counted. Yeah, from, from the Census Bureau standpoint, we consider April 1st to be Census Day. That's the day we take, you know, look at taking a snapshot of the entire United States. So I would tell you as a Census employee that um, wherever they're at on April 1st is where they need to um, have themselves counted. Not to speak for Patrick, but I think Patrick would say, and the Michigan Nonprofit Association says, wherever you consider you spend the most amount of time, that's where you should consider your residence. So, uh, I would say Michigan, and then that answer. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm, a, I'm a census employee. I care about the entire United States, but I'm a Northern Michigan resident. I care about Michigan too. Um, so that's that's one aspect. The other is just you know to let you know what to expect. So um, you're going to start seeing the media blitz. Uh, I said at a meeting this morning, you might start seeing almost as many ads for the census as you do Mike Bloomberg. So it's, it's going to be, um, it's going to be coming radio, TV, newspaper, really putting out the awareness, letting you know what the toll-free number to call in if you want to go that route, letting you know about security, letting you know about um, encouraging you to apply online. So starting in March, uh, you know, the week of March 12th, the first round of postcards will go out encouraging people to self-respond. March 12th is also the day that the portal online opens up to report yourself and the toll-free number. When you call the toll-free number, it's important to know you're not going to be going through some digital chaos uh, maze. You're going to be talking to an actual person who will ask you the questions that are uh, need to be asked. So the portal opens up. I know uh, Patrick said that July, the self-reporting closes, which is true. But we're going to give you, we're going to mail out in March the first round. There will be four rounds of mailings that will go to your house if you haven't responded. And then we're going to start knocking on your door, um, just like the numerators did in the 1800s. And we're going to knock on your door. And I often tell people, if you don't want the federal government knocking on your door, I encourage you to fill out that census as soon as you can, and, and we won't. Um, but yeah, in May is when we start knocking doors. The jobs, still available. I know you think 60% is great, 100% is going to be great, and that gets my bosses uh, off my bad once we have 100% recruitment filled. Those are great, those are really good jobs. They're very flexible, so you know if yourself or you know anybody else, um, you set your own schedule and by the week, so you can tell your supervisor, I have five weeks available this week because I'm running the book club at my house, but next week I can give you 20 hours, and then uh, you'll be given as much amount of work as you say you have available time, and that work can be done um, at your schedule, leisure, anytime really between uh, Monday through Sunday, reasonable daylight hours. So, uh, you two have really touched on most everything. I wanted to talk a little, make sure you know a little bit about the postcard and how it's coming. Um, the funding is important. We talk about kids, a lot of people say, well, how, why are children under the age of five undercounted? Um, Ten, we did the audit in 2010, they determined over a million kids were left off. And a lot of that is, um, you know, toddlers may run a house, but they're not considered to be a person in the house. Or we have census workers who will talk to somebody at the door and they'll ask all the questions. And the last question is, is there anybody else that we you haven't mentioned that's living in the house? And they say, no, I got it. I've got my husband and our son, Tommy, he's nine. And that's it. And the sense where, well, what about the baby in your arms? As we say, and, you know, oftentimes just overlooked. So um, we want to make sure we get it counted. It's critical for school funding. Um, yeah, kids in our account, homeless. A lot of people ask, how do we count the homeless um, population? We do it in sort of in phases. So we have group quarters. Right now, group quarters are considered any living situation where people not related are living together. So dorm, dormitories, jails, uh, assisted living situations, and those we're going to start counting here really in the next two weeks. And there's a variety of ways that we can do it. A census worker can go in and do it. Um, whoever the facilitator is for that um, place can do it. Um, 
and we get that done. And then we move into um, like mobile living situations, so people who are living in RVs, people who are in that transient situation. We count them out at their um, locations where they're living. And then we have on March 31st, census workers are out on the streets everywhere in the United States. We count all the homeless living in what we call non-sheltered situations. Um, but that includes like opening a YMCA, um, soup kitchens and things. But we're also out looking at park benches and parks, under overpasses, places that we know uh, have tent encampments, Walmart parking lot, Meyer parking lot, trying to identify if somebody's in their car. Uh, that's all counted on March 31st. So you think that's that's a massive operation uh, all in itself. And they count people a little differently in that situation. So uh, if Patrick was in his car, uh, we're going to do the best that we can do to see who's in there and make a judgment call. Uh, but a census worker is not going to determine uh, what Patrick's race is, what his age is. We're just going to say, it looks like it's a male and um, one person and go from that. Um, we just do the count. We get to ask the citizenship question. I know it came up politically, and I'm not here to touch on that, but I, I, I do get asked a lot about um, counting non-citizens. And it's important we're counting everybody living in the United States. So I know, you know politically, a lot of talk about people south of the border, but here in Michigan, we need to be realistic. A lot of Canadian citizens that live in Michigan, that work in Michigan, um, and we count them because they're here using the services. They're driving down the roads. They're using the libraries. They're using the the services that are funded. So it's important that they're counted, um, and we can you know get the funding to give, provide the same service for them as everybody else. Yes. The one question no one has asked, and I've been asked it frequently. Post office box. Up here, a lot of people have post office box. You know, and I'm glad you brought that up because that was actually what I was going to lead with, and then I got a little distracted, and I apologize. Because we talk about, I'm talking about the mailing that you're getting. Well, everybody in northern Michigan, so there are census census offices all throughout the United States that cover a particular territory. We have uh, here in Alpena, Marquette. We have uh, anything north of Grand Rapids in the UP is covered by the Traverse City Area Census Office, and everything within the Traverse City Area Census Office. We'll receive this, your postcards in the mail, but we're also going to receive something at your door um, on your house. So the census does not mail the post office boxes. Even if you live in um, a, lot, a lot of our villages and small towns around here, you may have a 123 Main Street address, street address, but your mail goes to a P.O. box uh, within that city. We do not mail to P.O. boxes, so you're, you're going to get something dropped on your door. Um, and in those cases, you won't, um, you may, but you most likely will not receive those postcards. You're going to continue to get it dropped at your door. And that's why we're looking for so many employees, um, hired staff to do that enumeration, because it's not just going out and me talking to you um, and getting them filled out. It's going out in that first round and that second round and dropping things at the door. Um, and there, they'll be in a plastic bag. The envelope is quite large. It will include a return, um, self-addressed stamped already uh, return form. So if you don't have internet access, um, if you don't have the ability to call in, or you just plain out want to do the paper form, that that's, that's your opportunity right there. And they base that's all based on um, Wi-Fi and internet access throughout Northern Michigan and the UP. Yes. Where and how do people apply for the jobs? Good question. Uh, that is, you, you have to apply online. It's at 2020census.gov backslash jobs. And we have some flyers that we we'll leave on the table here um, where you signed in that has that. There's also a toll free number where you can call and, and they're going to ask you the same questions. It's an assessment based application. So if you do it online, First, it's going to ask for your email and your register. Then it's going to send you an invitation to apply at that email. Um, so a lot of people use um, have false emails when they sign up for things. You want to make sure you're using an email where you're going to receive something um, and check your junk, junk mail if you do do it to make sure you got it. And then the assessment takes about 10 minutes. They ask you some 
questions you'll find strange to you, like uh, walking in the rain, and uh, really trying to figure out, you know, if it rains for 30 days straight, are you going to go out and enumerate? Um, so you just can't answer those questions, and I encourage everybody, whether you do or don't want to, um, to do the supervisor assessment at the end. This is just about another five minutes. You never know. Yeah, we're handing around the, the cards now. And the, uh, Patrick alluded to it, but it did. The, the wage depends on the county you're in, so. They set wages based on workload. In addition to the hourly wage, it's pace, um, it's 50 cents a mile for mileage. So the three requirements are, you be a U.S. citizen, you have reliable transportation, and you're 18 years or older. Uh, they do now have waivers for green card holders um, who would be hired at case-by-case -case situations, um, lack of other applicants or you know, language needs. Any other questions? Yes. I love the question and answer. Are the, are the mailings quite distinctive? Yeah, yes. Yeah, it's a really rather large postcard. It's going to uh, stick out. Like if it's in your mailbox, it's going to it have to be bent. You know, for not not folded, but it's going to big enough where in a traditional mailbox, you know, it's going to kind of have a U fold to it. It's. I've got some mailings recently that say census on them and they look like never mind. Open it up and it's a political party asking questions. Patrick say and I and he covered it and, and I and I, and I covered every time I talk to a group now is that yeah well you, you'll, census will be over and then we'll come to you and we'll talk to you about um, be careful of scammers be careful of don't give out your information don't give out anything and then here comes the census and we're asking but we are not but we are not asking anything like. Any, if, there's, if there's any question uh, you're being asked, you, if you have a question about it and you, you wonder, and they're asking for anything that could give you access to your finances, it's not the U.S. Census. So. What about people who don't have mailboxes because they get hit by a snowplow or snowbirds that remove theirs over the winter? Yeah. Again, here in northern Michigan, everybody sitting in this room, your Census information will be left on your door, and they come to the house. They, they assess what they think is the most um, accessible door, or whatever door. You know, a lot of people have a front door, a side door. Uh, they put it whatever door they can A access, and B they think is you know the most used door. So you'll Are see. Are they going to leave that code then on the door then, because they can't mail it to you? The code? Yeah. The code is on the postcard, so yes, it'll be there. But if you lose your postcard, you don't. You, you never got a postcard. Um, you go on that online portal or you call the 800 number to talk to somebody, you can still self-report yourself. It's just going to ask you a few questions about your address. And really, essentially what it's doing is um, it's going to have to verify your address. So all, all the addresses are geocoded, which means that if you ever like, shop on Amazon, sometimes you like, shop somewhere and you sign up, it gives your address, and then you put in your address, and it gives you like three options. It says 100% match, 80% match. That's what it's going to do. And Can you just mention that how we had a pre-operation to locate we all yeah. known donors? That's good. Yeah, Laura. That's um, we did an address verification process. So when we are looking, the census isn't mailing something to you. They're mailing something to your address. Um, that we any address is considered a residential uh, address, and we started years. Years ago, we really start immediately after every census. We start the next census, but we use um, maps and address information provided by local governments. We use past census data. We use GIS uh, to go in and, and look from above and try to determine if it's a residential. And then if there's any questions, uh, back in August, late July, August, census workers went out and knocked on the door, and really what they were asking is, you know, does somebody live here? Is this a residential home? And they verify it. I live in a situation where I have a, the only single family home in my little small subdivision and I'm sandwiched in uh, with some apartments and mostly um, condos. And they, uh, the condos and the apartments all use the big drop slot mailboxes with the key. But I have a mailbox. So the census looked at that and said, 
this doesn't make sense for this area surrounded by uh, different addresses. Um, so they came and knocked on my door and verified. It's also a good reason why we want to hire a local because the person who knocked on my door while I live in Traverse City is from Livonia. I just want to make a couple of additional comments. Um, I think Patrick mentioned it, but one of the reasons the Community Foundation got involved was because of some interaction that Patrick had at the state level with the um, Community Foundation Association. And it was an interesting story when he brought it back to the board, should we participate in this? He was kind of shocked that they didn't, the state did not see Northeast Michigan as a critical player. And he insisted that we be folded into that. Um, because what you need to realize, and the reason the community foundations uh, and nonprofit organizations are so concerned, is that if we don't get proper return on our tax dollars to our state, that puts a greater burden on nonprofits and all of the organizations that have to fill the gap, um, for example, with poverty and education and so forth. So that's one of the reasons that the Community Foundation got so involved and you're seeing so many other organizations, especially with the massive cuts at the federal level to help fund um, the Get Out the Word. Um, and then lastly, uh, one thing I think you might just encourage people, we all know them, who are concerned about privacy and all these sorts of things, government surveillance, just remind them, and especially with this being electronic, um, every time they use their phone, they're being surveilled by private companies, Amazon, Facebook. So and we all have to be cautious, but this is probably one area with consequences that are much greater than shopping online <laughs> and what we do to um, get what we want. And if you just kind of remind people of that, maybe they won't view this as such an invasion, an invasion of privacy. If this is a really important. I can just add to that because obviously you care enough that you came out here on a cold night to, to learn more about the census and to get a little more in-depth knowledge. So I, I look at you now as what we call a trusted voice in the community. When you're talking to your neighbors and you're talking to their friends and they say they don't want to participate in the census, um, you take back some of what you've learned here today, just some of the importance and try to encourage them. You know, we, we, we will keep knocking on the door, but that doesn't always mean that we get in contact with somebody and we don't want to lose, you know, we just don't want to lose any count. Um, Michigan was, in the last census, was ranked fifth in um, self-response. Let's do better than that. Yeah, but also see, but in 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 your area, and, and I'm not to speak to um, you know what potentially happened, but I do speak to often the fact that if you look at a state level, um, let's face it, we all live in Northern Michigan. I mean, this is well, I live over in Traverse City, and I've told Patrick this four times last year, but this is like where this is my my family's happy place is the whole Alpena to Oscoda. We camp in Harrisville, and this is. We, we love it here, um, and we could be over here all the time, we would, but it's, I look at Lansing, um, let's face it, we get, I mean, we get ignored a lot. I think we get ignored probably more in Northeast Michigan than we do in Northwest Michigan, um, but we just don't have the representation. The state senator who represents in our area from outside the city of Traverse City, he actually goes all the way up, his district goes all the way up almost to Escanaba. I mean, that's... And I'm not saying he doesn't service his district. I'm saying that I used to work for a state rep and we had a, a portion of a county. That's an insane amount of territory. Um, and you know, to be the voice of Lansing and to fight for us and to fight for what we need on every issue that comes up, um, we need everybody counting so that we, we can keep, perhaps get more representation. Um, I know the growth in Northeast Michigan is not as significant as it has been over in Northwest, but I do look at it like I, uh, we're all Northeast, Northwest, UP, we're all sort of brothers and sisters in arms that we're Northern Michigan. We live a different lifestyle, we operate a different way, we think a different way, and that's why we like to live here. But Southeast Michigan doesn't, you know, they have the population, certainly, but we have to, we have to fight for everything that we, that we get. And I care about the whole state. I don't, I don't want you to think that I'm uh, bashing on Southeast Michigan, but... 
really, we want our roads fixed. We want we want our programs funded. Arctic's doing an amazing job, and you could use more funding, I'm sure. David, thank you very much. That was very informative, and Tim, thanks for adding uh, a number of things in. What I want to talk to you about is, I want to say thanks to Patrick, because without Patrick's leadership on the Community Foundation, the $50,000 that was given to this region, we would not have. We wouldn't be doing any of these special projects. We wouldn't be reaching out and trying to get the count um, like we are. So thank you for that. Um, so we, Lifelong Learners, received one of the $2,500 grants. And um, our approach has been to the senior citizens. Our project is named uh, Census 2020 Senior to Senior with awareness, education, and support. So we chose three pillars to do. And we are working with the counties that predominantly our members are from, and that is Alcona, Mount Morenci, and Presque Isle. Now, we would say Alpena too. You will see that Alpena seniors got their own grants and they're doing their own projects. And we will happily work with, with and have, are collaborating with anybody else that's gotten a grant. Alcona, I believe, got a grant. Um, there's some of the libraries have gotten grants. And so we are working together with anybody who touches the senior population. And we are going out to, um, I personally am taking Mount Marenzi County. Um, Mark Kenny's here and he's working a lot with Press Keel. Sue Nagy and Dick Bremer are working in Alcona. So we've kind of split it up between the three of us and we're working with the um, councils on aging and finding out where their seniors are and going to them and talking to them about the census. And I have to tell you, I was shocked when I went out the first few times, people said, were like, census? What's a census? Why are we doing a census? Why do I want to participate in a census? And so, you know, the information that we're getting out there right now is really critical. And we are talking to them about a lot of the things that Patrick talked about, the security of it, you know, what not to do, don't give out your social security number, don't give out any bank information. And it's surprising to me how some of that has not, people are like, oh, yeah, well, they don't need that. No, they just need a count. They don't need any of that information. So we are continuing and working really hard and trying to target all of the seniors in every possible way we can because they are a targeted group. And internet access or lack of it is huge. Or even knowing how to use an inter the, a laptop or a computer. So one of the things that we're going to be doing is, in the libraries, there's always public computers there. So we'll be having times that we advertise the hours that we'll have representatives there to assist any seniors who want to come in and fill it out online or just fill out the paperwork if they're concerned about that. Or a little, I, I had one lady said to me, oh, we don't have a computer. And I said, don't worry about it. The library does, and we can help you with that, or we can help you fill out the paper portion, or show you how else you can self-report. So from our standpoint, that's our project. And Patrick, thank you for giving us this money and giving us the opportunity to really help to make a difference. And I would encourage you to, if you have any time, you want to volunteer to go out to one of the libraries when we start setting this up, I would, we welcome volunteers. We'll train you very simply what you're going to do, and we just would appreciate any support we can get. Sure. I just want to add one thing because we are talking about careful the scams and the finances. Has anybody in past census in the past ever received the long form? No more long form. So everything is short form this time. But caveat to that is the census um, census doesn't just do the decennial 10-year census 
If you're listening to NPR and you hear jobs report, you hear building, you know, housing reports, those are census surveys. So the, the short, the long form was replaced with what they call the American Community Survey. So that's uh, it's, a, it's a it's a random, um, but you may have. Um, I'm always surprised how often I run into people who have gotten that information. So you talked earlier about <clears throat> uh, being able to know like, education, you know, background. That's the kind of stuff that would be captured in the ACS, the American Community Survey. And yet in that, in that survey is quite long and does ask a lot more detailed questions. So as we say, you're not going to, you know, the census won't ask anything about finances. If you have a friend who says, I got this thing from the census and it wants to know what the annual income is, and it does ask those questions. It doesn't ask bank account. It doesn't ask Social Security. It doesn't ask anything that can get access to those finances. But it will ask some questions that some people think are intrusive, but that's really how we track, um, you know, where where movements are happening, markets, jobs, um, stores opening up, everything. So it'll ask how many bathrooms you have in the house. It's just um, it's very it's very detailed. It also comes with a letter that says if you don't um, comply, you'll be jailed. <laughs> Census is never sent anybody to jail, but uh, it is in statute that you. Um, comply, so uh, they put that in there. But that, so you might run into somebody, or some, somebody, so they did ask this, or maybe I've already done the census. I got it back in August because you know the last one happened this summer. This is different. So. We got a question from over there. For the paper one, if you don't want to fill out all of it, so you just fill out some questions, are they going to mail it back to you and say it's incomplete? They will not mail it back to you, but if they feel like they're still uh, data that they need to collect, they may still, they, a census worker may still come and knock on your door. For the online um, one, a lot of online things like job applications or whatever else, they'll have page one, page two. You can get to page two if they, on, on page one you don't fill out everything, and they don't give you an option on the question to say, I do not, I choose not to answer this one, or none of your business, or that. So do they have those options? that you're going to be able to choose which questions you want to ask or not, or is it not going to let you to proceed to the next page, so then you're not going to be able to submit it, because it will keep giving you an error message that that's not... It will not. The census is self-reporting, so we're relying on you know, individuals to self-report everything, so it, um, again, you're going to be able to continue to move through it, but if they do an audit, they feel like there's information that they would you know, need to capture, census worker still may knock on your door. But does each question have it that you can choose not to answer that? It does not have a, I do not choose the answer, but you can move forward. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you again. And I want to turn this over now to Doris Thais, and she is our, the president of the... Um, <laughs> There's a lot of information coming out here. Yeah. So, I'll, keep, I'll keep it uh, short and not sweet. Thank you. And I would like to say I am actually co-president of the um, League of Women Voters of Northeast Michigan. Pauline Butner is my co-president, and bless her heart, she came out tonight. Um, I don't have a whole lot to add, except to say that the League's mission is twofold here. One is education, and we've already put on some educational um, programming just to encourage people to, to participate in the census. But I think our bigger role as the League of Women Voters, and as correctly noted, we're celebrating our 100th anniversary with the passage of the 19th Amendment in, 20, in 1920. Um, our main goal is to inform and um, educate voters and to encourage more citizens to take part in the democratic process, to make it a more real democracy. And at the basis of this, I see it as a circular thing. We really need to get an accurate count. Uh, Michigan is now uh, working on putting together a redistricting commission, which was part of the passage of Proposal 2 in 2018 so that we will be less gerrymandered and that citizens 
will be redistricting the voting districts. And we absolutely have to have a fair and accurate count for that process. So um, we are doing what we can to help out. Um, and I will be talking with you, Patrick, to see how else we might be able to help out locally. At our board meetings, we've already discussed some of the places that might have traditionally been undercounted before. Um, but this is really too important. This is too important to ignore, so we're all in. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, you know, I mentioned briefly that the Michigan Nonprofit Association has put $6 million out into Michigan for an accurate count. Uh, Governor Whitmer recently allocated $10 million for an accurate count. And what I have been told is that she's going to look to have every governmental office open and available for people to go in and, and fill out the census and be counted. So as you spread the word, you know, if I could just, you know, if you could just tell everybody that it's critical and that it is confidential. And if you have any, like, if you have internet access and you really want to like, really dig in deep or see, they have a great nine minute video of how to fill out the census. You go to 2020census.gov and there's um, a lot of really cool stuff there. So I, I want to give everybody an opportunity. I, we've had questions as we've gone along, but let's open it up for a Q&A for a few minutes right now. If you have a question that you wanted to ask that you don't want to ask for anybody else, I'm not leaving until I talk to the last person here that wants to talk to me. Nancy? So I heard libraries will be having a computer that could be useful. And you said something about town offices and other government offices. Are they also going to have computers that can be used? So I do know that a lot of libraries are engaging on that level. Right. Uh, I also know that Michigan works. Um, at all of their locations have computers and people available to help. I, other than hearing that the government offices are going to be open, um, I don't have any concrete. I don't know, Dave. I've heard, I've heard it, but I have not seen anything like a, in paper that says it. But they're also going to be, and I cannot, because uh, they haven't determined where yet, so I can't speak to like this location, that location, but um, the census is going to have mobile units that are going to be going around too, so they'll be setting up Really, they're going to be in areas that have low internet access, so it's very likely we're going to see it over here. Um, but they'll be parking at you know, fairs, festivals, um, farmers markets, places where there's a gathering of people, and they'll have you'll have the ability um, to use the, the devices they have there um, to go on the census also. So they'll be um, it'll be advertised, but they'll be all around the state. So bring it to us again. Run. So how do you, how do they guard against double counting? Yeah, they have so a, that's a, here, oh, that's a, that's a great parents, oh, I'm going to fill something out here. That's a great question, and it comes up a lot uh, when people are talking about college students. Because, mm -hmm. you know, um, somebody living in Alpena that wants to count their son or daughter here, but they go to school in Ann Arbor. Well, they're, they're going to be counted, actually counted in Ann Arbor, because that's where they're considered to spend the majority of the amount of time. But there is, they cross-reference. So if they see Billy Taylor, 19 years old, uh, white male in Alpena, and then they see Billy Taylor, 19 years old, white male in Ann Arbor, you're going to cross-reference, and that's where you um, may have a census worker follow back up with you at your door. To, uh, and that's how they determine a million kids were left out. But there is a, in Chicago, where Michigan is part of the Chicago region, which is eight states are covered there, the typical Midwest states, um, up here, you know, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois, Missouri, um, Indiana, so Arkansas. But there is a, a, so our main headquarters is in Chicago. And if you go in, and when I was training a year ago, this door was open to a room, giant, giant room. And, it was filled with computers. It looked like a NASA rocket control center for the space shuttle. And I said, what's in there? Like, they said, don't step in there. If you step inside that room, that is quality control. You can't work both jobs by any means. So if you step foot in there, your job as a partnership specialist is done. You can only hope that they'll 
they'll hire you for quality assurance. And that's, uh, it makes sense because they're going to also going to do random. You may fill out everything on your census and still have a census worker knock on your door maybe in September and ask you the same questions. And what they're doing is they're just they're doing a quality follow-up to make sure census worker um, didn't just sit in their car and fill out ran, you know, fill out everything for Alpina and, and say that they were done for the day. So they do they do checks on them like that. They do cross-reference on information, check and verify. Uh, it can really catch you. you know, if I have everything matches between um, somebody living in Arizona and somebody living in Michigan, they're going to do a quality assurance check on that. So, okay. it's a great, great question. Yeah. Any other questions, Ron? Yeah, bring us back to the college student. Uh, big dormitories. So somebody goes into that dormitory and Yeah, we work with the dormitory so they the they can enumerate they can enumerate you know um, each college can choose their type of enumeration. Mm -hmm. Most choose to um, hand out a census form to all the students because it's self reporting. Um, some may re have that information and report that to the census for the students. We encourage them to hand it out and have the students self-report. So if it's a, you know, if they're Native American, we want to make sure that they're identifying with the proper tribe, and we're not guessing what tribe they belong to. Got a question over there? Yes. Um, yeah, for the people that have never um, filled out the census, do they have to wait 72 years to find out what their neighbors or somebody else yes. put down to them? Yes. That they have to look up and say what was put down. That information is kept private for 72 years. They're released. Tim? I would just add, if people bring up the issue of the citizenship question, which is probably the most political issue of this current census, um, just realize there were a whole lot of factors involved. But the Census Bureau does actually collect the citizenship data. Um, I think it's done through this American Community Survey, um, or at least it has been historically. And um, that information is pretty 90% accurate, um, according to the Census Bureau. And so they're, they're getting that data, but I think with this particular census, they wanted to keep it confined. And so also dealing with, you know, if you put that, how much else do you put? And keep in mind, the Constitution is not asking that question. It's asking who is residing in this country. That was the ultimate objective. And then from there, you can do additional things, as the Constitution said. But, but that data is being collected already. Um, and I, I just think it's important to remind people um, that that's not a reason to bow out of this, given the consequences. It's collected through all the, uh, through all the states, too, the driver's license. Now required all 50 states you know, citizenship, so they, they can they get that information that way. Well, I think I'm going to bring this to a close. If there's any more questions um, that you want to ask directly either to Tim, Patrick, or David, they're going to stick around for a few minutes, and uh, they'll be happy to answer those questions. I want to thank everybody for coming out and, and, and understanding the importance of this and what it means to Northeast Michigan. It's really critical. So thank you and appreciate it. Thank you.